much to her dismay, I think of my older sister. My older sister and my mother are nearly the same person. It really, really is the same person. And I believe that almost every day of her teenage years, she and my mother have picked a fight about one thing. I don't know what, the car, the this, the that. If you ask my sister in her 20s when she had calmed down and grown up, she would have said, no, I just fought with my mom. I got along with my friends. I got along with my dad. I sometimes got along with my siblings. I got along with my teachers. She wasn't under a lot of strain. She liked to fight with my mom. And my mom, unfortunately, liked to fight with her. And so, <laughs> hence, a psychiatrist stands before you. <laughs> but the truth is, that's normal kind. When people talk about teenage moms or the, the challenges of individuation, where you're trying to step back and become more independent, that's not what this is. 20% is actually what shows up in well-done psychological studies, where they go into the community and say, do you have something serious going on or not? It's 20%. And that includes mood disorders and attention deficit and substance and everything. It's 20%. And so interestingly, the kids get it right. The teachers and the parents always say 60 to 100. Perhaps a different perspective. When you look at a young person's whole life, there are different ages at which different disorders are more likely to happen. So it's pediatricians that are diagnosing autism in very little kids, because you can tell that. Pervasive de developmental delays are things like really delayed language and motor skills. That's what shows up when you're a toddler. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder starts by age six or seven. And I'll talk a little bit about that because most parents of teenagers, given the choice between their 15-year-old having new onset ADD or new onset depression, would pick ADD. The problem is that would be inaccurate. ADD starts by six or seven. It doesn't start new. Now, could you have the amazing teacher who put you right in the front of the class and kind of got you through the first couple of years? Yes, so I'm not saying that it's not that sometimes it's missed, but it doesn't start at 15. As far as school age, so we're talking about lower school, the little ones, anxiety. That could be separation anxiety, it could be GAD, which is generalized anxiety, it could be OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, we have these ideas you're just stuck on and then had to have to do certain things to deal with them. You know, the classic is I'm worried about germs, so I'm gonna wash my hands. So those kinds of things where you're doing very particular things or have to follow a ritual or touch something a certain number of times. So that happens at younger ages, but it's in high school. You start seeing the significant mood disorders, more access to substances and substance abuse problems, escalating problems with eating disorders. Now, some people will say, couldn't these start earlier? Well, of course they could. We're just talking about if you took a typical teenager, this is one reason we think it's so important to talk to high school kids and make them aware, because these are the ages that a lot of them will experience this for the first time. When we talk to the students, so the high school kids, this is the concept we talk with them about, little d versus big d depression. Because depression is the same word, meaning I am disappointed that my Ravens lost to the Steelers. I'm from Pittsburgh, which is why I'm from <laughs> So we're using the same word to mean I'm upset about something as trivial as a football game versus I have a potentially life-threatening medical illness. It's a bit of a problem, I think, language-wise, we've done that. No one's going to listen to me. We're not going to change that. So that's what we're dealing with, talking about. Are we dealing with the kind of depression that's a normal feeling that everyone will have versus the kind of depression that's a medical illness? And that's what we're going to talk about. How do we distinguish those two? If you work at a place like Hoffman, sometimes you do weird things, like you are asked to be on television, which I did once. It was very strange. But what happens if you're ever on television and you're a psychiatrist is that your high school friends will call you up on the phone and say things like, I'm very worried about my brother and I need your help. <laughs> so my friend Jill, who I had not talked to for 15 years, <laughs> called me up and she told me I was fine with her brother. And I said, you know, I'm really glad, and he was in treatment. That wasn't the issue. She said, my problem is with my parents. And, you know, we're good, solid people from Pittsburgh. I knew her parents were very lovely. She said, why, what's going on? She said, well, they are convinced that my brother has been struck lazy at 27. I said, oh, well, that's an interesting concept, struck lazy at 27. He's been this good kid, and now suddenly when he's not able to function, they think it's his character. And she said, right, what can I tell them? And a dear friend of mine said, no one can remember more than three things and it has to fit on a matchbook cover. 
So what did I going to tell I said, okay, here are the three things expanded to look pretty on a slide. We know what it looks like. It runs in families. It's a great disease. We know what it looks like. We can tell the symptoms and not perfectly, but in a pretty accurate way, I can tell the difference between big D and little d. We can look for the symptoms. You can say this is the syndrome. We know it runs in families, the same way that diabetes runs in families and hypertension runs in families. And we know it's a brain disease. Now this is where I wish I could be more explicit because our knowledge of the brain is not in any way matching our knowledge of the heart or the lungs or things that are easier to study. Almost every day I'm very grateful that we have skulls. You know, they protect us. If your boys are playing sports, you're very glad they have skulls. I mean, all of these things, but it does make the brain really hard to study. And we are going to need better imaging technology and other kinds of things to really understand. What I can tell you is if you have a stroke in the left front of your brain versus the right front of your brain, you have a different risk of depression. If you have certain conditions, as I'll show you in a moment, you have a different risk of depression. So we know it's the brain, but I cannot tell you exactly what it is in the brain. And our treatments are limited and frustrating sometimes because of that, as I'll talk about later. So here's a fascinating combination of facts. Here are five neurologic conditions. And on this column, it has what percent, if you went to a clinic where they take care of patients with Parkinson's or MS, migraines, Alzheimer's, or Lou Gehrig's disease, what percent of those patients being treated there would also have depression? And what you can see is there's this big trend that for the first four, roughly 40%, so a very high percent, much higher than 5% of teens, or as I'll show you in a little bit, it's about 20% of women, 10% of men, so much higher than expected. For ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, it's what's expected for the population. Any biology people that say that makes sense? Because it doesn't make logical sense, does it? Migraines are horrible and annoying, but they are not Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm -hmm. So how, why would this disease, which is one of the most challenging, not actually lead to an increase in big D depression? It doesn't mean it doesn't lead to demoralization and grieving and suffering, but why not depression? Something about the brain. Exactly. The first four of these conditions are all central nervous system. Oops. Central nervous system. So all four of these are brain diseases. ALS is actually in your motor neurons. So it's outside the brain. It's actually in the peripheral nervous system. And that's why we think there's a difference. So then it's what else is it about you that was gonna make you more or less likely to get depression the same way that I'm at risk you know, for a certain amount. Everyone's at risk for a certain amount. So when we think about what's the clinical syndrome, these are the symptoms we're looking at. And I see them as falling into three big categories. If you look in the DSM, they'll say it's this many of that. I don't find that very useful because at the end of the day, you're really trying to figure out, are you sad, demoralized, and grieving, or do you have depression? So the big three areas I use to differentiate those two is looking for changes in mood, changes in physical symptoms, and changes in what I call self-attitude, your feelings about yourself. Because mood and the physical changes, if you're hearing it, you'll say, yeah, some people with grief could have those. But that how you feel about yourself, your sense of self-confidence, that is not something that typically changes with grief for just being demoralized, okay? So mood, it can be a change to either be sad, irritable, or to feel nothing, sort of have a lack of feelings. Teenagers, what do you think they're more likely to have? Well, on an average day, they're more likely to be irritable, and not surprisingly, they're more likely to also, when depressed, be irritable, which is tricky because they're irritable anyway. This is what I always say to parents. You have to figure out how they are with other people. You are their freedom. <laughs> you, know, you are their, the holder of the keys and the holder of the allowance and the holder of the you can or can't go on the trip. So given that, how they are with you is not the same as how they are with their favorite coach or how they are with their favorite teacher or how they are with their closest friends or even how they are with their siblings sometimes. So you have to look at how they are with lots of people. And the problem with depression is the irritability spills over beyond just parents. It often starts there when it's mild, but it spills over into other relationships. And then the second symptom listed here is also a mood symptom, which is you can't enjoy anything. You can't get excited about anything. You can't feel that sort of, oh, this is great. The word for that medically that we use is anhedonia, so a lack of hedonistic and pleasurable things. 
And with teenagers, something I hear from parents all the time is, my child will not go shopping with me. And I say, of course they won't. <laughs> what are you thinking? Why were you thinking they were going to? I don't want to be seen with you. I don't mean that. <laughs> A teenage boy or girl does not want to go to the mall with their mother. A teenage boy or girl wants to go to the mall with their friends. So when someone says she didn't want to go shopping with me, I say, of course she didn't. The boys sometimes don't want to go shopping at all. That's like a different issue. But think about, they didn't want to go and do this thing with us. Like, well, were they willing to do it with their friends if you gave them money to do it? No? Well, that's very worrisome. That's a different thing. Or for the first year in six years, they didn't want to play soccer. For the first year and six years, they weren't going to, you know, go out and do lacrosse and these kinds. So then you start saying, well, no, wait a minute, we're having changes, which is also important. As far as the physical symptoms, they fall into this appetite, sleep, energy, concentration, etc. Now, as far as appetite, some people just lose their appetite, and when they're depressed, they say they can't even taste food the same way it doesn't taste good. They can't be bothered. Other people comfort eat. As I say, if you are comfort eating appropriately, it does not involve salad or carrots. <laughs> so you have to, so you're gonna gain weight. If you just can't bother eating it doesn't feel good, then you're gonna lose weight. So you have a weight loss or weight gain associated with how you respond. As far as sleep, most teenagers when they're depressed spend more time in their room. It's just to isolate. So what you have to ask them if you're sitting down doing an assessment is not how much time are you in your room, but how long does it take you to get to sleep? Once you're asleep, are you waking up through the course of the night or are you actually staying asleep? Because I think it's one of the worst and most common symptoms of depression, that you're suddenly up at three in the morning with negative thoughts spinning in your mind and sort of these very negative feelings there. And hopefully in your house, no one else is up. I mean, that's a time that you're very alone and feeling these negative things when you're very alone. As far as feeling restless or slowed down, they seem contradictory. The reality is that most people, most of the time are pretty fatigued and pretty slowed down. But teenagers often have these moments because there's sort of tension and irritability. And this is a difficult thing. Marijuana and alcohol and other things help. Not in the long term, just in the short term. So it's very understandable to me how a young person who is battling depression, you know, you, there's, no, there's no teenager in America that couldn't be at a party this weekend, or maybe tonight. I'm being serious. Like they can find these things. So they get exposed and they're exposed. And if you are having the experience of not just what alcohol would do for any of us, but also saying, oh, I feel better for the first time in a month, it's more addictive. It's twice as addictive, it's triple. I mean, it's just much more addictive. And so that's a big issue. But as far as energy, generally it's lower. People are quite fatigued. Now concentration is obviously what you see in school. I mean, it's what teachers might notice. But for many teenagers, their grades have a lot to do, again, with their privileges and their freedom. So what I often will ask, I of course ask if you notice changes in how you're doing in school and all of that, but that's not enough. You also have to wonder, is it taking you longer to do your homework? Is it harder for you to get through the reading? Do you feel like after you've done it for two hours, you have a lot less done? Because that's what they will, these young people often describe to me. I can kind of do it, but it's so hard and it's exhausting, and, I, and you know, nothing about it's enjoyable, and I just don't like it. And it's hard to do things you feel like you're not doing well, <laughs> for any of us. You know, we tend to do the things we think we do well as opposed to the things we think we don't do well. And then the last two symptoms are the most serious. That's where you get into those feelings of, I'm not a good person, I don't think I'm contributing, I just don't feel good about myself. And you can see how you could very easily get from there to thoughts about myself. With my older self-attitude change, this is really severe. You know, I just don't feel like I'm contributing, I'm not a good person. With milder changes, there are things like, I'm just not someone one, I'm just not someone that people want to be friends with. The boys will tell me they're wimps. You know, I'm not strong. The girls, unfortunately, will say I'm fat and ugly. Middle-aged women usually say I'm a bad mom. Middle-aged men say they're a bad provider. And older people feel like they're not worth being around or that they're, they're not, they're a burden. You know, so the, the theme is whatever I value most, and thankfully for women we get past the fat and ugly, usually. Uh, the theme is that whatever I value most, I just can't feel good about how I'm doing that. And that starts much more, you can pick that up a lot earlier than I don't feel like I'm a good person, I'm not contributing. 
the key of all of this is to obviously pick up these symptoms sooner rather than later, not wait for them to really get out of control because then they're going to be impairing. No. Dick Cavett, most of you probably have heard of Dick Cavett. Dick Cavett once famously said, being depressed is feeling so horrible and having so little energy that you can know the cure is across the room and you can't stand up and go get it. Mm -hmm. You know, just sort of have this like, oh, I can't do it. With teenagers, I mentioned, they're more likely to be irritable. They're more likely to have this sort of this like, ugh, anhedonia. And I think very importantly, they are now developmentally at a stage where they can feel hopeless. Seven-year-olds are not feeling hopeless or not hopeless. Seven-year-olds are wondering if their friends can come over and what they're having for snack. Right? I mean, their, their world is this big, it's not this big. The problem, of course, is that teenagers still, though, have a world that's this big and not this big. They are not, you know, they, they will react. And their reaction to things is so intensely distorted by their thinking. So if you are... Let's take a boring thing that happens, and it's probably happening as we speak to students at the St. Paul School for Boys and Girls. They're breaking up with their boyfriends and girlfriends, or getting back together with their boys, or breaking up again, or whatever. They're all texting each other, and things are happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're well, you might decide that the girl's a fool, or it's your loss, or you're upset about it, or you're not that upset about it, or whatever. But your reaction's going to be in proportion. If you're depressed, your reaction's gonna be way out of proportion. And then suddenly, something that's just a normal part of adolescence that we've all gone through, that we all get through, becomes intensely important. The analogy I use um, all the time is that if you have a little pebble you throw in the pond, you should get a little ripple. Little rock, splash, big rock, big splash. With depression, a little pebble gets a pretty big splash. And a big rock, you're get, and then a pretty big rock, you're in a tsunami wave. Because you just can't think it through. It, you literally have a distortion in your ability to be logical. Now, thank goodness all this is temporary with treatment, but at the moment, it's intense and it's, it's difficult. I mentioned anxiety that goes along. We've talked about the kids isolating, not doing things particularly with friends. That's the big change that's most worrisome. And then somatic complaints means that they will have physical kind of a headache, stomach ache. School nurses often know, you know when things are going on because it's just that sort of nonspecific. And then we mentioned, you know, we talked already about how substance abuse can get really out of control quickly. This quote is one of my favorite quotes that describes depression, and it's because teenagers have brought the book in to show it to me. Mm -hmm. Dr. Schwartz, this is what I'm feeling. It's the Dementors. This is from the third Harry Potter book. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare also describes depression in the sonnets, but none of the kids bring that in to show it. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't come up. I think it's beautiful, but no, 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 we're not having any of that. But this idea, this idea that every good feeling and every happy memory is sucked out of you and you're left with nothing but the worst experiences of your life. That's what kids say. They feel. This is awful. I focus on mood disorders because people can get better. Uh, I just say that multiple times. That's the point. But in the midst of it, it is intensely painful. So to make the diagnosis of major depression, saying someone has big D depression, you're looking at having at least five symptoms for two weeks. Do you think anyone shows up in two weeks? Nobody shows up in two weeks. My record is a smart medical student who was doing her rotation in psychiatry who said, oh my gosh, this is me, and it was about two months. They recently did a very well done national survey to see what's the average time from starting to have symptoms to getting treatment. Any guesses about what the delay was? 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's eight years. It's eight years. And you figure that's the median, which means that for the people lucky enough to have it not be years, there are people that never get treatment. And so eight years, which means that most Young people in high school with depression will have it completely missed. And I see that all the time. You look back and they say, you know, I'm seeing someone, maybe their boss has said, you need to get some help because you're not functioning. Or a mom who's now trying to have a family, she has a postpartum depression, and I have to do something about this because I can't function. And it's a very common story to look back and say, I really had that bad year in high school, but I don't know, I was a teenager. 
I had that bad, I had that, someone described it to me as their drinking semester in college, as though that's like a requirement for graduation. <laughs> <laughs> and my drinking semester in college, like, well, that's not required, you know, so the problem is that with younger people, we're so ready to write off their difficulties, their irritability, their crankiness, their everything else, that you're, that everyone's in danger of missing it. Obviously, we don't say something's an illness if there aren't problems, you know, if you're having some kind of clinically difficult time. The third point uh, actually gets to this whole interaction with substances. When I started my residency in 1991, we had a very wrong-headed idea that you had to be clean and sober for six months before you could diagnose depression. Now, if you were using substances to treat your depression, how are you going to get clean and sober for six months? So we've moved past that. And I'm happy to say I was trained by people at Hopkins that never believed that idea in the first place. But we're not thinking that anymore. What we're saying is that if someone's intoxicated or withdrawing, wait till they're out of that acute phase. But then usually you can see and get the story that, yeah, I was feeling this way and then I was doing this and I feel differently. They can, young people can tell you that. And then finally, I'm gonna, with major depression, you're thinking about just low moods. With bipolar disorder, which I'll talk about briefly, you have both really high moods and low moods with mood switching between the two. So why make a diagnosis? I remember coming home from medical school at Hopkins and talking to my closest friend in med school pediatrician and said, do you get accused of labeling kids? So what are you talking about? I said, well, I spent all day being, I was doing psychiatry, being accused of labeling kids. Were you labeling anyone today with diabetes or asthma or any of these other things? And she said, I don't even know what you're talking about. This doesn't make sense. I said, right. My goal of making a diagnosis is the same as yours. We're going to figure out what's going on. We can have a treatment plan. We can have a prognosis. We can go forward. The problem is that there is a different level of stigma for asthma than there is for depression. And so people, it's like it's an accusation. I said, actually, it's a medical diagnosis that has a plan associated with it. But you have to have a little bit of thick skin. So Zulay had mentioned that it's about 5% of teens that will have depression. Before puberty, it's rarer, it's one to two percent. That's still not trivial, but it's, it's rare. And interestingly, with, with the beginning of young women having their periods with puberty, the rates in young women is twice as high as the rates in young men. And that continues through menopause. And then we even out again in old age. But it, in the middle, there is something, and when you think about premenstrual dysphoria, postpartum depression, menopausal mood changes, we know this relates to hormones. We also know that estrogen and progesterone have feedback loops in the brain to areas that are really rich in serotonin receptors. So it's all related, but again, we know less about the brain than we should, so we'll, we'll figure that out eventually. If you compare 5%, it's at least 5%. Other studies have estimated 10 or 12%. This means it's nearly as common as asthma and a lot more common than juvenile onset diabetes. So this is just one of the most common illnesses that teenagers have. So what happens if a young person has depression and it doesn't get treated and they're lucky enough to survive? Well, it'll probably take about seven to nine months to get out of it. That's a whole school year. So that's enough time to decide you're not such a good student. Or maybe you shouldn't go to that kind of college. Or maybe you shouldn't pursue that kind of career. I mean, I think that's long enough to actually have it shape your view of yourself. The challenge of early onset depression, and this is without treatment, because this is only recently that we have figured out that everything is not a parent-child conflict. Before there were SSRIs and people were afraid to treat children, there was a lot of parent-child conflict, as opposed to now there is illness, which there was before, but we got it wrong. That's the bottom line. If you have the onset of depression before you're 18, you're at high risk of having it recur if you're not in treatment, which is why it's very important to be, for uh, young people to understand what they have and to stay on treatment or at least have a plan and not go on and off and on and off, which comes up a lot, as you can imagine, especially as children go to college. That's a time that many young people decide they'll see how they do off their medicine because, because you're not there to make sure they're taking there are, uh, there's a small group of people that don't do well with the treatments we have now. That's very frustrating, that's honest, and they have longer episodes typically. And it's young 
it's those that have the onset of depression when they're younger that are at higher risk of bipolar disorder. So five to 10% will develop bipolar one, which is the more severe manias and depression, and about five to 10% will develop bipolar two. So it's really 10 to 20% that are at risk. And the only reason I bring that up is that if a young person has bipolar disorder, but they don't know it, and they present with depression, the right thing would be to treat their depression. But you want the family and everyone else keeping their eyes peeled to say, I wonder if this is actually bipolar disorder, and let's just make sure we know what those symptoms are and look out for them. Which is why I just want to say something about mania. So mania is the opposite. If you based your knowledge of mania on television and the movies, you would think it was fun. You would think we should all have it because they have this ridiculous distorted idea about this. It is true that when people have very mild mania, they often enjoy it. And unfortunately that gets in the way and sometimes people taking their medication because they're trying to recapture that. But it is the opposite. So if you take that same mood, physical symptoms, feelings about yourself that I talked about for depression, well for mania, your mood's over the top. Tons of energy, you are completely excited about everything. And unfortunately, you also have a level of confidence that is sometimes literally delusional, meaning it's false, and you have ideas that you can do things you simply can't. You don't need sleep, you're talking a mile a minute, you can't get anything finished. I saw a young man um, who came from the West. He lived out on a ranch with his family and he came to Hopkins for a visit. And his parents described that it took them, yeah, they lived out in the country, so they were gone about two, two and a half hours to go do some errands. They came back and their young son with bipolar disorder had started 17 projects in that time. Zero completed, zero even close to completion because it's like I'm doing something, I'm excited about that and we you know, go to another room to get a, a tool or something. Completely forgot that that was started, got into something else and they just walked her and said that's when we figured there was something, like this was not just, he didn't want to do his homework. Like that, well, these were all things he was excited about. But there's a terrible distractibility and you can't actually stay focused. The other thing is, is that there is a complete lack of judgment. So young people will do dangerous things. They will spend in a way that doesn't make sense. They will drive in a way that's dangerous. They will engage in, they'll be engaged in sex, drugs, and rock and roll in a way they hadn't been before. And so it's dangerous because they're not actually thinking of consequences. And sometimes you just have to say, if it gets really out of hand, that's when Sometimes it's best just for someone to be in the hospital so you can get them safely, you know, get the symptoms under control. Bipolar disorder and manic depressive illness are exactly the same thing. Uh, there was a, I'm not quite sure why, but a vote and manic depressive illness became bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Bipolar implies that there are two poles, which makes sense, elevated moods, low moods. Here it says that it's three symptoms for one or more weeks. It is true that, as I was saying, no one's coming to the doctor in two weeks. The manic episodes are usually much shorter, and so it might be that someone really only has manic symptoms for a week or two. But once you're up, where do you imagine your mood then goes? It's down. It is not even in the middle, almost ever. And so the problem is, is that sometimes, especially if they're brief and not that problematic, someone won't even recognize that they have a mania. And they'll come say, I have depression. And then you'll take a step back or get their family involved and realize they're cycling like this. The manias aren't that bad. If they're a little high, then they crash for six months. And they're a little high, and then they crash for six months. So it's important just to make sure you're treating the right thing. So these are the things I hear all the time uh, that I think are frustrating for the people that are going through this. Someone say, oh, it's weakness. You can do, my son was struck lazy at 27. Okay. You, can just, you can just get over that. It's mood, you're not sad, you don't have depression. If you're not sad, you don't have depression. It's always due to circumstances. Now this I find fascinating because we used to have this concept in psychiatry of a situational depression, which is not very useful. And the analogy I use with the teenagers, which I find helpful, is to think about asthma. So if you have asthma and you visit your friend with a cat, you might have an asthma. If you have asthma and you clean out your grandmother's dusty attic, you might have an asthma attack, or an asthma attack that might come out of the blue. I'm nearly 50, so I remember my friends with asthma being told to go sit in the corner and take deep breaths, and maybe it would pass. We've come a long way in understanding asthma, right? No one would do that now. With the child, you immediately get their inhaler, you make sure you get it under control, because you're trying to keep it from getting bad. 
We also don't say, you have cat asthma, no inhaler for you. Whereas you have dusty asthma, you may have an inhaler, and you have out of the blue asthma, you get an inhaler. That is ridiculous. But we do that with depression all the time, don't we? You have break up with girlfriend depression. No treatment for you. you have, so it just gets wacky. We are storytellers naturally. And the difficulty is, is that we're, it's a chicken and egg issue. When someone's depressed, their reaction to things is so intense, you think, oh, that must have been terrible. The point is, see whether the person's depressed. Don't worry so much about what the triggers are. The triggers, you get lost. You get completely lost in those stories, and then you miss things because you're writing them off. I'll talk a little bit more about antidepressants, but they are not addictive, nor are they uppers. If you do not have a mood disorder, and you take an antidepressant, what happens? Anyone know? Nothing. You might have side effects. And if you were going to have side effects, you might have side effects. But nothing happens with your mood, unlike, say, cocaine. Cocaine is actually an upper. Almost everyone that takes cocaine has a change in their mood and then a crash. But you know that is, that is a different kind of medication. And that, I think, is important to realize, because people have this idea that they're mood altering. It's like, no, they're really mood restoring. You're getting back into health, the same way that insulin is, you know, glucose level restoring as opposed to something else. So here's what I hear from parents. Oh my gosh, I feel terrible, I missed this. I cannot believe it, it's in my family. Or the least helpful, I can't believe it's in your family. <laughs> that is not helpful at all. The other thing that I know from experience is that it's in everybody's family. <laughs> and anyone that thinks it's not in their family just doesn't know about their family. I'm being serious about that. And so what you have is the honest parent somehow getting scapegoated and the other one, you know, maybe not knowing or just not saying. That is not useful. The other thing that's not useful is to get into this whole, he's going to get over it, she's going to get over it. Parents fight about whether kids should get in treatment. And they fight about whether treatment is necessary and they fight about whether this is a medical illness. That is a problem. I just talk about this whole life stress. You know, I hear all the time is, well, we're getting divorced. Okay, 50% of new marriages end in divorce. <coughs> that is, you know, 50% of kids are not depressed. Come on, this is not the issue. The issue is that was a stressful thing that happened. We're all vulnerable to a different degree. Some kids will have that trigger of depression and most won't. So take a step back and say, not are your parents getting a divorce, but are you depressed? Okay, that's the important thing. And this whole willpower thing is just preposterous. But it's where we are. And we are, you know, we are those people, right? We're going to be strong, and we're going to this, but it's like, oh, no. So when I think about treatment barriers, this is my little schematic of what happens. The first thing is no one knows what's going on. Or we certainly could not have our child getting that kind of treatment from that kind of doctor. That's useless. And you are not the group that has to worry about that. You came out on a cold Thursday night to hear about this. So whether it's for someone in your own family, or you're those good eggs that come to everything and then worry about the kids. <laughs> that is who comes at night, the good eggs. That's great. Um, our insur I, I don't have enough time, really, in my life to talk about how broken our insurance system is, but that, it just is. But then there are issues of resources. You know, we know resources. We can help with that. You know, it's a, there are resources in Baltimore, so that's not so much the issue. But you actually have to be thinking it's something to do. And then there are people that don't respond to the treatments we have. That is frustrating. That's real and that's frustrating. And that's why you stay engaged and sometimes if things aren't going well, you get a consult, you get someone else to take fresh eyes, you do something else, you know, in that sense of saying, and hopefully we will keep having better and better options. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our current treatments because they have limitations, there's no doubt. Many, many studies have shown that the best treatment of depression at any age is the combination of psychotherapy and medication. Just taking medicine isn't enough. Just having psychotherapy isn't enough. It's the combination. And if you, any of you know how to get teenagers to take pills willingly that aren't going to work for several weeks without psychotherapy, I would love to understand that. And because the psychotherapy is often, this isn't your fault, and you can get better, and this is what we're going to do, and let's talk about how this has affected you and what can change if you get better. I mean, it's a whole process. But people don't just take pills. The other thing about pills is that most of us have a model from antibiotics and pain medicine, right? Antibiotics should work in two days. 
I think they should work in three hours, but I'm willing to give them two days, not longer than that. And if Advil doesn't work in an hour, you're fine with Tylenol, or more Advil, or something. But the point is that we have these ideas. So none of us are prepared for four to six weeks at a full dose. And teenagers are certainly not prepared for four to six weeks at a full dose, so there has to be a lot of education about that. It is quite um, disruptive for a family if someone's really having a rough time. It often affects the other siblings. It often affects the dynamics of how parents are getting along. And so there's often a role for family therapy, especially with the young person at home, because you know, people are, they, there's a tricky balance of how do we set expectations? How do we have rules? We want to be supportive, but we need to kick you in the pants sometimes. You know, finding that out. So I think there, working not just with individual therapists, but family therapists can be helpful. And then as far as supplemental treatments, those are things like, you know, this time of year we think about light boxes. I also think about things like, how much are you sleeping? I don't know how much the average boy at St. Paul School for boys or girl at St. Paul School for These kids don't sleep enough. I mean, I don't sleep enough either, so it's a little bit ridiculous for me to say this, but it's okay. I'm an adult. I can make bad decisions and just live with them. But the kids, they don't sleep enough. And yeah, that's okay, except if you have a mood disorder, being sleep deprived is a trigger. And exercise actually helps. And in mild depression, it can be actually quite effective. And in severe depression, it certainly isn't going to hurt. Taking a shower every day is a good thing. You know, I have a list of a couple things I'm going to show you, but they're important. Now, for the medicines, I've listed a whole bunch to make a major point, which is there are a lot of options. Only two of these medications, Prozac and Lexapro, are officially approved by the FDA for treatment of kids under 18. Most of the other SSRIs have been studied extensively in anxiety, so we know that they're safe in that age group. I simply want to make the point that you don't want to limit yourself only to those two because when something's not working, you want to try something else. And that's working with someone who's, again, that's where sometimes getting someone who's very experienced with this to weigh in or say, I think we should try this different. Yes. A question about the medication. Have they done, because I've heard so many contradictory things in the media uh, about uh, the selective serotonin inhibitors in use in uh, children under the age of 18. Have they done any long term studies on that? Well, they, Prozac is quite old, and there have been all kinds of thoughts, and there are, you know, the there are some controversial questions about GI irritation and some things like that, but unlike some of the older medications, they don't seem to have long-term, there's nothing consistent that shows there's any long-term organ changes or brain changes or functioning changes. There are individuals, certainly, that can have all kinds of different side effects, which is a different thing, but when you look at the big studies that are looking at big collectives, there aren't anything that are consistent, to be perfectly what we you know will need to know over time. But Prozac came out in the late eighties, so there are people that have been on it for now, you know, thirty years. That have that were lucky enough to do well on it. It's really on it. This is a picture of the brain that implies that we know more about the brain than we do. Because <laughs> <laughs> so here's a neuron. This is to represent neuron one and here's neuron two. It is true that if any of us take an SSRI we will block the reuptake of serotonin so that more serotonin builds up in this space between the two neurons. That happens with everyone. That's not about having depression, not having depression. That's just what it chemically does in the body. What then happens is that if you have more serotonin here, there will be more binding to these receptors on the second neuron, and they will send more signal. And that is where our knowledge really falls apart, unfortunately. Sort of what happens next, we don't know. I learned as a chemistry major that when it says second messenger effects, it means we do not know, that it's complex. <laughs> That's the honest part. The theory, which I think, I think is correct, is that it's probably a 15, 18, 20, 25 step cascade. So yes, this happens. You block serotonin and reuptake, and then there is more signal, and then the signal triggers something off. We think probably turning on certain pieces of your DNA to make certain proteins, et cetera. Now it makes sense, if it's this long cascade, that that could take 46 weeks. When we understand the brain and can have something that works at step 17, one hopes it would take 
a lot less time, and that will be wonderful when we understand it in that way. I think the biggest limitation of our current medications is this delay, because people are suffering while we're waiting. I think the other limitation, and this is a real limitation too, is that I can't tell you for any individual person the perfect thing. If you had a urinary tract infection, a sample would be sent off to the lab, and within a day or two, they would make sure you're on the right end lab. Right, we can do that. Sensitivities and specificities. We don't have a way to do that for the antidepressants. So it is hopefully thoughtful and careful trial and error, but it's trial and error. I mean, that, that's the honest thing. So this is a picture I draw all the time for people when I'm working with them. And it is meant to represent how you would love for someone to get better, but you know they won't get better like that. And I'll say that, I'll draw that, I'll say, look, we both want you to get better like this, but we know it's not gonna happen. Right, it's just not. And then I draw the second arrow and I say, but this is probably how you think it's gonna go. Every day is better than the day before. And then I tell them I've never seen that in 20 years. <laughs> and it's important because you want people to get that unfortunately it's gonna be some ups and downs. And I draw this when people are having their first good days. Because it is much more demoralizing to go down once you've been up. It is the worst. Because then you're saying, no, 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 look, you're still better than you were a week ago or a couple weeks ago. This is psychotherapy. And what you have to do is have people understand what the path is going to be because otherwise, it's just overwhelming. I wish it were the second. That, oh, I wish it were the first, actually, but that would involve some kind of like a zippy new scan or something. But I think it's very important to be honest with teenagers. I think teenagers want to hear the truth. But I think you also have to engage them and say, we're not giving up until we get something where you feel better. So here are the other things that really do help. For mild depression, occasionally they're enough, rarely, but the truth is mild depression doesn't come to treatment. Kids are doing this on their own. Now I've had people say this is the first year I didn't play this sport and I'm really feeling it. Well, probably because the exercise and getting rid of all of that adrenaline did a lot of good. So getting sleep, exercising, having some healthy eating. One of my very closest friends in the world has terrible depression, and she once tried when she was in grad school to live on V8 and pretzels. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing? So I started bringing, I can't cook, but that is why there's Eddie's. So I started, you know, taking <laughs> dinner. It's like, I'm bringing a salad. I was like, okay, but you know, that's the point. When you think about how you can support people, your friends, other people, these are the kind of things you can do. Let's go for a walk. Okay, I know you can't concentrate enough to watch a movie, but you know, isn't that why the Big Bang Theory was put on television? I've decided it doesn't offend anyone. There's nothing bad about it. It's only half an hour. Most people can watch something for half an hour. I discovered it when I had the flu last year. If you're lying on your couch for hours at a time, you it's very boring. <laughs> it's usually, I'm not usually my MO, but you know, if you can't move, you can't move. And then this whole getting up, taking a shower, and leaving the house, I refer back to the flu. We've all been there. By day three, you're going to get yourself in the shower, even if it kills you and you fall on your head, right? Because you just can't stand it anymore. Anyone with depression, that's a struggle. They just can't be bothered. And then that doesn't feel good, and then they're embarrassed, and they don't want to see their friends. So that really is a big piece of, no, we're doing this. It's also very important, and I say this with schools all the time, I want my kids to have a reason to go somewhere. So if schools can be flexible and say, you know, and again, this is all very individualized, but a half day or a part of a day or something is often better than saying just, you know, stay out till you're well, because then you're more isolated and you're not with other people. So what happens with these other conditions I mentioned earlier? With young people, it's more the norm than the exception that they'll have two things going on at the same time. And you can imagine that, one, because if you have ADHD or anxiety when you're younger, unfortunately, you're at higher risk of having a mood disorder later. Dysthymia is this condition where you have really mild depression and then have dips at times where you go into lower periods of depression, into major depression. And then I mentioned earlier already substance abuse, how that can happen. And with certainly some young men, but mainly young women, they find that even binging and purging and those things distract them or they feel better briefly. And so again, 90% of young women diet. So they're kind of trying it out. And again, if you are vulnerable because you're not feeling well, you might get into some of these behaviors in a more out of control way. For young people, cutting is the same way. 
you know, superficial cutting where they are not trying to harm themselves but making very superficial cuts on their arms or legs or somewhere, that they often describe that too. I don't have to feel. I, I think it's one of those things that's just scary and disconcerting and you're thinking, how could that possibly help? Well, I've talked to literally hundreds and hundreds of young people who have done this and that's what they describe. It's so intense that it distracts me from my feelings for a little while. So it's like alcohol. I mean, that's what I've come to understand. Now, there are other reasons that other people do it, but for the young people I'm working with with mood disorders, it's usually a distraction. An incredibly intense, not very understandable distraction. And when people are not motivated, again, assume you're in the good A category. Uh, you're trying to convince your brother, your cousin, your neighbor, somebody else that they really need to do something. Here's a piece of information. There's a cohort study in New Zealand. Again, this is not treatment. I want to be clear about this. It's not kids that are getting treated. They just have been following. They're sociologists who have been following kids since their birth. And they show up every so many years. And when they saw this group when they were teenagers, they did an assessment to say, are you depressed or not? And you know there's, I don't mean this in a bad way, but you know there's social scientists, not doctors, because they didn't do, they said, okay, we'll just see what happens. Like that, I can't imagine such a study. They're like, all right, you're all coming with me now. <laughs> but they didn't. They said, we'll just come back, and in your 20s, we're going to compare the group that had depression when they were teenagers to the group that didn't have depression. And again, this is without treatment. The group without, you know, that had depression who almost all didn't get treated. Remember the eight-year delay. They were more likely to have depression and anxiety. That makes sense. They were more likely to be addicted to substances. More likely to have made suicide attempts. They didn't go as far in schools they would have predicted because they have all this information. You know, they could say, we expect you to graduate from high school, graduate from college. More likely to have no job and more likely to have either fathered a child or have given birth to a child at a young age. So these are not the outcomes anyone wants. And it makes sense if your brain won't work properly. It's hard for you to be at your best and to make your best decisions. And, you know, it is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So there are people that are also saying, that's one way I can feel better. And there are a number of people that are happy to convince them that that's a good plan. <laughs> so depression is common. It's at least five, probably more like 10% of teenagers. It, I always try to use numbers that I can defend and show you the study, but it's at least 5%. And when we're thinking about this, we have to just make sure that we are having kids suffer the least. That's how I say it. And someone asked me once, isn't it um, you know, sort of upsetting to treat mood disorders? I said, not at all. It's the best thing to do in psychiatry. We have the best response rate. People get better. You know, this, is, this is a very hopeful thing. And you, know, you, don't wanna, you don't want to, it's not for the faint of heart, though, because you do have to have the argument and say, I know, but it's only been three weeks, and I want you to hang in there, and you can be mad at me that my medicine stinks. That's okay. I agree with you, but let's go. I mean, I think that that's part of this whole process, too. That you have to be engaged, and it takes a village in the sense of parents have to be cheerleaders, aunts and uncles and others that know have to be cheerleaders, their therapists, doctors all need to be cheerleaders. Sometimes the school needs to be cheerleaders if they choose to talk with their friends, if they can be cheerleaders. That's my big grandiose idea of ADAP. If we have the whole ninth grade knowing about this, and after a couple years we have the whole school knowing about this, then people can be more supportive. Because everybody is going to have somebody in their life. But there is no one that I can imagine, unless they have no friends, and they do not speak to their family, that they're not going to be touched by this, because it's that common. So, I want to leave a hopeful message, which is this is very, very treatable, but one of the biggest barriers, especially with young people, is identifying it, and not just saying, oh, you're being a teenager. I rather like teenagers. They're very honest. <laughs> <laughs> They'll tell you if they're boring you. As we were developing this program in schools, they told us. The first comment I got from some young people was, you talk too much. <laughs> we want to talk more. Stop talking so much. I'm <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> and now it's a very different program. Because, yeah. you know, it was written by a psychiatrist who teaches adults at Johns Hopkins. And then we got the teachers to help us make it much better. So. I am happy to take questions. Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about what the research shows about any connections or correlations between internet use and adolescence and depression? 
Oh, sure. So the interesting thing, let me, let me, there was just a recent study with bullying that might be helpful. Because bullying is a horrible thing, right? I mean, we know that. And what they've shown is that having a vulnerability, having had depression before, having a strong family history of depression, makes you much more likely to have the reaction to bullying of depression. Because lots of kids get bullied and don't get depressed. Bullying's horrible, we should not have it, but sort of the triggering off something else. And so I think that's probably the same with the internet and other things. At the same time, as a psychiatrist, I cannot say how strongly I hate Facebook, okay? So here's what I hate about Facebook. Of course, a few of the things I hate about Facebook because we don't have three hours. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that these teenagers know which parties they're not invited to. I didn't know which parties I wasn't invited to. I went to the parties I was invited to. I didn't know where I wasn't invited. I didn't care. Those were not my friends. I hate that we are recreating that Norman Rockwell painting over and over and over again on Facebook. So here's a fact. It was just recently in the New York Times. You know that Norman Rockwell. We're about to have Thanksgiving, right? Any of you going to have that Norman Rockwell Thanksgiving with that perfect turkey and the scrubbed up family and no one's fighting and everyone's talking? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So here's the fact. Norman Rockwell's first wife had a very severe mood disorder. And Norman Rockwell moved from New York to New England because at that time, it was like the 30s, 40s, New England had the best inpatient psychiatric care in the country. Norman Rockwell did not have that life because nobody had that life. Okay. But that expectation where we're making these comparisons, is really hard. So, the, so there are a couple other things about the internet too, but just that idea where they are comparing the best version of yourself that is accurate for 30 minutes a year, you know. Because based on Facebook, we are all going to a lot of weddings. Yeah. <laughs> and parties or what, you know, it's just crazy. Now the other thing that's worrisome about the internet is that young people can find out all kind of information they shouldn't. Young people can be preyed upon by just hideous people that are looking for vulnerable people. And more importantly, they can have this sort of funny idea that they're connected to people when they're not. You know? I, so I worry about all of that. At the same time, I went to a, a holiday party my sister was having for some good friends. Some of her friends' teenage kids were there. They were all in this TV room. There's a football game on or whatever. They weren't even looking at that. They were all texting, of course. They were not speaking to each other. I think they might have been texting each other. I'm not sure, but I, I don't think. There was no speaking. And I just, I worry about that. And so I, I'm all for, here are the hours where you can do it and when you can't. And you know, so is it great that I can do a search and make sure that none of the medications I'm going to prescribe are going to interact and that it's updated every 10 minutes by micromedics, that's fantastic. But, you know, I think these other things are difficult. And my big point after that long answer is I think the more vulnerable kids are more vulnerable to what's bad about it. And, and that's the worry. And vulnerable kids using, say, video games and just like mm -hmm. numbing themselves? Is that mm -hmm. like yeah. an addiction? No, I do, I do think it is. I think that anything distracts you is potentially addictive if you are feeling lousy. I am treating a lovely college professor who said, I'm watching garbage television. Now, in and of itself, that, that's not a symptom, but she is someone who usually watches one or two hours of TV a week. It's like, I like the news, I'll put it on while I'm cooking. She's an English professor, she reads. Said, okay, so for her, you know what I mean? So it's more the, oh, that is not what you usually do. And so I think that's the, the worry. So I think anything like that, but you know, the level of violence in these games is appalling. And I think anytime people have images that something's okay, that's pretty worse. That's been shown to be problematic. You know, just sort of these exposure to violence. So that that is problematic. Yes, sir. Along the lines of bullyism, schools are trying to uh, get kids to obviously cut down on that and, and get them all involved and helping each other out. Mm -hmm. As far as mood disorders, is it too much to, uh, to think about how kids could help each other in a group therapy kind of way? Or is it 
Well, here's the interesting thing I would say about that. I think there's an, there's an importance of having different people having different roles in your life. So I have worked with lots of people at the hospital and have gotten, have helped them get into treatment. And they said to me, well, who should I tell? It's like, well, there are people here who will be open about it, but they're not all your friends. Do you see what I'm saying? And so do I think there's a role if you want to have some sort of support? Yes. Do I think there's a role for everyone being educated so people won't be knuckleheads and say thoughtless things? But I think you have to be careful about who you're in a therapy group with. And I thought about this a lot because it used to be the grand tradition of psychiatry that all residents were in a therapy group together. And I trained at Hopkins where they stopped doing that. And I asked our chairman why one time. He said, because therapy is really powerful. And group therapy is really powerful. And suddenly you've made your colleagues, you know, you have a different relationship with them. And so I think that there, groups can be very powerful, but I think you want to be careful about whether you're having your school buddies versus your intensive therapy group people. Do you see what I mean? Because there's a role for school buddies. And so then I just think you have to be thoughtful in, in which things you're doing. At the same time, one of the things we talk about with the kids in the program is what could you do to help your friend? And so there it's very much practical things. They come up at the end with a list of things they can do to help. So get drag them out to the movies, go for a walk, go over and play sports, go watch the game. I think encouraging people to have those kind of individual interactions is really important. The other thing is that most people with depression get pretty overwhelmed with too many people. And so a series of short, supportive, sort of activity-based interactions is probably the best thing, as opposed to a really intensive group or something of that sort. I don't know if you have anything to add that, but I just, it, you know, I think you want to be careful that school stay school and treatment stays treatment. And I say that from my clinician vantage point, because, you know, you want school to stay school. Now, could there be another group, say, in the community or something? Absolutely, but then you're making a choice to do it. Yes? So, um, if you know that your family has, like, a biological disposition, mm -hmm. um, what, is there, I don't know if they've done any studies on this, um, what you can do to prevent depressive episodes in yeah. children? So, I haven't, there's never been anything that's shown that is primary prevention, meaning you can keep it from happening. I think one of the most important things you can do is to change the eight years, 20 years, 30 years delay. Because I think there's enormous problems and disability that come from it going on for a while when the person doesn't know what's going on. So the same way that I grew up knowing that all the women in my mom's family died from gynecologic cancer and that I was going to the gynecologist and that was non-negotiable and that's what it was because this runs in our family I think there's something to be said. When people are little, you're just watching. You know, you're, you're watching out, and maybe you do or don't reach out to the, you know, someone at school that you trust, like the counselor, and saying, look, just if you notice anything, let us know. But usually you're watching, and if, you, if you're not sure, you can ask. But then I just think being very proactive, because I think the difference between, look, this isn't our family. It's, we're going to take care of it. It's not a big deal. Different families have different medical problems. That's a very different experience than most people are lucky enough to have, I think. But there's not a, you know, do you start this or that? At the same time, is getting enough sleep important? Absolutely. That whole list of the healthy right, things. Right, right. Probably being a little more careful about that. Or even just saying, look, I know that we are, as a family, we are people that need our sleep. And maybe being a little more careful about that or having more, you know, just saying we're going to do that. But those things can certainly not hurt. But I, I would love it when we got to the point of actually being able to prevent, but realistically there isn't anything right now. But the difference between a couple months or eight years, 10 years, 20 years is enormous. That's an enormous gift to give someone. Um, how about just like tips to getting them to talk? Because we were mm -hmm. in a group with, with um, earlier this year or something, and one of the boys mentioned, I hate when I, when I get in the car and the first thing they ask me is, how was your day? And it just shuts me down. So, you know, you've heard that, you're like, oh my gosh, you say that every day. <laughs> That's the first thing I say. So now I try to switch it up, like, you know, just, you know, say something, you know, 
How's your lunch? <laughs> starting with something neutral too. Yeah. You know, not how was your day, but right. you know, I don't know what something of interest. Wasn't that tragic? <laughs> <laughs> Should 
not that you should, you know, wait them out. I don't mean that, but you, know, you can say something, and but don't keep talking the whole time. Right, and right. Just, you know, let it be quiet for a little bit. They'll probably jump in with something. Mm -hmm. A walk's a great idea, but anything where it's not, I am now going to, you know, yeah. face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, starting with the neutral stuff sometimes helps. And with boys that, you know, whatever they love doing. What, yeah. So what is the plan? I know you said you're, are you going to be talking to you talk with the ninth grade boys? Are you going to be doing this program with the boys or? Well, you could tell them a little bit. It's a right. So the the program that we developed, and this is over time, where it is now, we are in a model where we train the professionals in the school, so it's sustainable. And so she's all trained up to teach a three-hour curriculum that is facts. It's like all kinds of facts you get in health class about cigarette smoking and and lung cancer. I think it's similar in that way, except it's about depression. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole theme of this three hours is depression's a treatable medical illness. But we talk about illness and symptoms, and there's a whole how do you make a diagnosis where we use cough and pneumonia as an example. So just getting them thinking, yeah, it's like other medical illnesses. And then there's a film where teenagers who have this illness talk very openly about their experiences. Obviously, teenagers that volunteer to be in such a film have had a good experience with treatment, and they're sharing that. And then the third day, there's a film in which I'm with a young actor, and we're modeling a little bit about what it is to talk to a psychiatrist, because again, Hollywood has put some pretty wacky ideas out there about what that is. And then um, the kids do an activity together and you know, teach each other at the end. And so it looks like any other kind of health class. And so. It makes depression education just like any, we hope, like any other part of health class. It's not weird, it's not different, it's not this big deal, it's that they come in and it's three hours. And actually it was St. Paul School for Boys and St. Paul School for Girls and a couple of the other local independent schools that helped us develop all this 15, 13 years ago. So it feels very good that we're now completely full circle and it's sustainable. Right. Um, are you gonna be doing that at the girls' school we have someone? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. Um, yeah. Yes, the girls get that training wing or that education in the ninth grade. They also revisit in the 10th grade health class, so they get kind of a double dose. Um, so, yeah, was, Karen trains me as well, so I teach the ninth grade, and then Susie Black, who is our nurse, will teach the health. And she trained with us before, and so it's, you know, I think everyone has to hear things multiple times to learn to learn them but i think there's also i mean our goal was to have this be just a normal part of health class because it's common and it's normal and you should know about it which also fights stigma this isn't some big weird thing we're only doing because there was a problem or a tragedy or something else like everyone mm -hmm. should know about this what's the magic um eight like ninth grade i'm surprised maybe it wouldn't be a little bit early so here's, here's the thing about that, and every time I do it, there are middle school teachers there, and they yell at me that it's for high school. I'm not joking. We're, you were witness to that. Like, I got attacked by the middle school people. The, the, there is something magical that happens when you go to high school as far as just being able to be a little more serious about topics. And so the film that was developed was developed for high school kids because you can be a little more honest. The younger kids, you know, it's variable. I have a really good friend from high school. Her mom was our middle school history teacher and she went to the high school. She said, I can't tell you how different it is to teach ninth graders than seventh and eighth graders. Mm -hmm. I said, what? How can it, you know, it's not that yeah. chick. No, 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 and I was fascinated by this. She said, well, there are two things that happen. One is they just have a different level of individual responsibility and the sort of a serious, like we're in the high school now. And so mm -hmm. serious topics I think can get handled mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. Could there be a program for middle school? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and. When we get done with the high schools, we'll think about that. We got a long way to go. <laughs> you know, so that's part of that. And the other thing she said is that I don't have to get mugs from every one of my students filled with candy anymore. Yeah. Unlike middle school where everyone is marching with their mom. <laughs> because they're done. She said, I love it. They could care less about bringing me a present when I'm in high school. But there's a little bit of a maturation. And then that's the presumption that you can actually have an appropriate kind of conversation. And the other reason in a practical sense we did it is that Although this is where we started and this is my community here in Baltimore, mm -hmm. we want to be all over the country and most high school health classes are taught in ninth grade. Mm -hmm. Almost every public school has a requirement that you take health to graduate. Mm -hmm. And so we have attempted to, to develop a program that I thought of Coach Bob, because I'm in you know, 
My public high school in Pittsburgh helped us top my coach Bob. Coach Bob, I'm not joking. And so, you know, that's what we're doing. And I think we, we have data, and we've looked at it, just getting pre-tests and post-tests and normal kinds of things. And we've shown that we actually can change what the kids know. Um, 